So this is a one hour intro to give you an idea of what machine learning is and uh, I guess an idea of what, what kinds of problems you can use it for. What this isn't is a comprehensive introduction. So if you want to, I guess, properly learn this or go into, go into a little bit more depth, I've posted a link to publicly available lecture notes at uh, U of T. Uh, some other things I should mention are that while the workshop here doesn't, asso doesn't assume a knowledge of linear algebra, if you actually want to learn this in a little bit more depth, that's kind of requisite knowledge. So if you want to follow along with the workshop and actually run the code for yourself, it's not strictly necessary for, for, I guess, following along with the workshop, but later on, if you want to play around with the code, uh, you can follow the steps outlined here to use, go, to use Google Colab to uh, open up the notebooks and run through the code. Okay, so first thing we're going to go over is a very brief intro to supervised learning. So what is supervised learning? Basically, you're trying to you're trying to fit a function y equals fx and y can be in a, y can be a uh, a scalar value or it could be a uh, vector. Uh as with x, it could be a scalar or a vector or a uh, matrix. But in any case, you're trying to you're essentially trying to predict an output y from an input x. So the data you can be trying to predict uh, can be continuously val continuously valued numbers, uh, categorical labels. Uh, or even, or even, uh, I guess, uh, ordinal numbers. So there are two. So there are two broad classes of tests you can do with supervised learning. One is regression, where you try and uh, where you try and predict a continuous value as well as possible. Then there's also classification, where you try and classify something into one of two or more groups as well as possible. So as a first so as a first example of I guess supervised learning will show you the least squares method for fitting a line. So, so you try and estimate your output y as a function with an intercept and a scaling term, a scaling term for your input x. In this case here, we only have univariate input for x and univariate output for y. So in terms of de deciding how good we're doing, we have this cost function j, which is a function of theta naught and theta one. And you, you just, you just calculate it as the sum of your estimate minus your actual value squared divided by one half times one over two times the uh, number of samples you have. So in order to do really well at this task, you're trying to minimize this function here. And what you end up getting, if you've if you're 
pretty good line is a line of where y is predicted to be given x fitting pretty nicely through, uh, through I guess the data points. So as you can so as you can see, these blue dots here, their distance from the red line in terms of the y-axis isn't way too far from the, it isn't too far. Uh, so one way you can try and find optimal parameters is through gradient descent. So with gradient descent, you, you essentially update the parameters by, by moving them in such a way that the cost function will go down. So you so you take the so you take so you take the derivative with respect to the with respect to the cost function, or the derivative of the cost function with respect to the parameter you're trying to update, and that'll give that'll give you the direction in which there will be positive change in the cost function with respect to that parameter. If you subtract that, then you should see the cost function decrease. So we showed you linear regression. Uh, logistic regression is kind of like legit linear regression, except the function that you use to predict y isn't linear. It's one over it's one over one plus e to the negative z, e to the negative z or e to the negative z, if that's what you prefer for that letter. In this case, if you have, say, two or more variables, you could express this as 1 over 1 plus e to the negative theta, theta transform by x. So this just means a two-dimensional vector for theta uh, dot product with two with two-dimensional vector for uh, x. So what this so what this function tries to predict is uh, whether or not why whether or not your sample is one for yes this is in this category or zero for no this is not in your example isn't in this category. This is just formalizing it from a uh, probabilistic standpoint. You can read it if you're interested. Uh, and then here's and then here's uh, more on the cost function. Here's more on the cost function here. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it too much. You can read more about it if you're interested. Again, you can use gradient descent to uh, try and try and optimize your parameters with respect to the cost function, and try and predict the predict whether or not your examples in are in one class or the other as well as possible. So with this code with this code and its outputs here, we're going to show a very a very simple example of an application of uh, logistic regression. So we have two variables, x1 and x2, and labels 1 or 0, separated by this line here. Uh, so in order to get the model to perform te poorly on test data, we're using a 50% training set and a 50% testing set. In real life, you might be doing some. Uh, there's more notes. Uh, there's more. There's a side note on this at the end, but you might have training parameters such as say 
your learning rate, uh, which is how fat, which is how fast you update the parameters, or regularization. So how much you penalize you penalize yourself for having lar large valued parameters to avoid overfitting. So you might so you so in real life you might try and optimize those parameters and do a training validation split of something like 60 to 20 60 percent training 20 percent validation and then once you have your uh, hyperparameters optimized train on the combination of the training and validation sets and then and then test on the uh, remaining 20 percent of the data uh, for simplicity here we're just doing training and uh, training and testing with no hyperparameter optimization. So anyways, we, we, get, some ran, we get some random data uh, with, 50, with 50 examples. And depending on where they land in the space of X1 and X2, our input variables, we we give them a Y value of one or zero, depending on where they lie, lie in the 2D space. So we take, so we take our training data here. We run logistic regression and we get a, uh, we get a fit logistic regression model from uh, using the using the uh, functions available from the scikit-learn library, and this is just show it. This is just showing the uh, this is just showing the uh, parameters we have. So we have uh, so we have our coefficients here for x1 and x2, and then we have our intercepts. Now let's see how it performed on the training data. So if you look at the green line, that's the actual line of separation denoted that delineates what's going to be called a head or one and what's going to be called a tail or red. So anything that's equal to one will be uh, a head. Anything that's anything with y equals zero will be considered a tail. The orange line here is uh, the, lo the line delineating where the model thinks the uh, point of separation will be. So with a logistic, so with a logistic function, 0 .5, a prediction of 0 0.5 is going to be the breakpoint, basically, that decides whether or not your heads in the blue here or tails in the red here. So the, the line doesn't exactly match, the line doesn't exactly match up with the true line of separation, which is to be expected. You started out with some randomly initialized uh, parameters and you just tried to make it better and better and better until you could uh, classify your points. So let's, so let's see uh, what happens when we use data that we didn't use in training. So the other half of the data. So the green line here delineates what's what's actually heads and what's actually tails. If we look below the green line, everything below it is actually heads. If we look above the green line, everything above that is actually tails. The labels I'm showing here with heads and tails are what the predicted labels are. And as you can see, everything below the orange line was predicted to be heads and everything above it 
was predicted to be tails. So what's the discrepancy here between, so why do we have this discrepancy here between uh, what's considered heads by, I guess, the re I guess the, uh, the reality of the, of the data and what's considered heads and tails according to what our model thinks well, th thinks it thinks is a uh, broad sense is a broad I'm using it in the broad sense of the term. So what's a so why do we have this discrepancy between the ground truth and what's predicted? Well, in practice, very often your model is going to be can overfit to your training data. And because of that, if you provide test data that doesn't exactly ma match the distribution of your training data, then you're going to be getting, then you're going to be getting some error. So below are just some other notes to read if interested and more on uh, more on train more on the basics of training regression models from the University of Toronto in this other link here. So with that done, we can move on to uh, unsupervised learning. Actually, first, does anybody have any questions? You can uh, put it into the chat. Okay, so one question is, do you have to manually indicate which values are heads or tails in the training set? So usually this isn't done manually. So I, so I manually constructed a data set of uh, whether, or not stuff is, whether or not stuff is heads or tails, depending on where it lies in the space of our input data, x1 and x2. In reality, you might have something like you have a bunch of features such as, uh, let's say you're trying to predict whether or not, whether or not somebody got diabetes or whether or not somebody got a particular disease in the past year based off of, uh, based off of measuring blood sugar, blood pressure, and stuff like that. So your inputs would be blood sugar, blood pressure, say height, width, weight, depending on what, what your data set has in terms of features. And then the output you're trying to predict, those labels would already be there. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. So usually, so usually the labels or the, the output you're trying to predict, that should come with, that should come with the data sets. Uh, you may you may try you may try and construct that by yourself based off of uh, you may try and construct a feature you're trying to predict based off of some criteria of some sort. But usually you'd be trying to predict something that's already a label that's come with the data. Uh, I guess if there aren't any other questions, we'll move over to the unsupervised learning module. Okay, so in the past, in the previous module, we went over supervised learning, which tries to basically fit, basically fit a function fx equals y equals fx. 
So y is equal to the function of x. So find structure in the data in an automated fashion. You're not specifically trying to predict labels or predict values. You're just trying to uh, take some high, take up what is oftentimes high dimensional data, like having say fifth, say two or more variables, and you're trying to find structure in it. Exa examples of this include clustering which attempts to divide data into uh, discrete groups based off of some definition of, sim of similarity. You also have dimensionality reduction. So that, that attempts to encode high dimensional data into, into uh, smaller sets of variables that can uh, separate the data uh, or embed the data in interesting ways. So you're, you're basically just trying to find interesting human understandable properties of the data. I mean, with some of the more complicated stuff, it might be a little less human understandable, but you're, try, you're, you're basically just trying to find structure in the data. So first we're going to go over uh, an example of dimensionality reduction. So what is dimensionality reduction? So often we'll deal with data sets that are high dimensional. So you might have 20 dimensions, you might have 1,000 dimensions. And by dimensions, I just mean variables. So the breast cancer data set we're going to be exploring here, it has 30, dim it has 30 dimensions for input data and uh, it has uh, one extra variable for the target label. So if you wanted to use this in a supervised learning setting for predicting whether or not this is a breast cancer case or not, go ahead, have fun. Uh, in this case, we're just going to be exploring the 30 dimensions of input data. Anyways, it's impossible for people to visualize stuff beyond two or three dimensions. Uh, another, another reason why you want to use dimensionality reduction is oftentimes with supervised learning settings, you're assuming that the similar, similar data points uh, that should have similar outputs are going to be close to each other in, in uh, Euclidean space or multi-dimensional space. So once you start really increasing the number of dimensions, you can actually do, you can actually mathematically prove that this assumption starts to break down. I'm not going to go into that here, but a further discussion of that topic is provided in a link. So what dimensionality reduction can accomplish for you is to pick up new properties of your data in high dimensional space and express them in a much lower dimensional space. So it gives you an automated fashion of finding those new properties while also expressing the data in a way better suited for downstream applications such as clustering or classification or just visualization. So just to give you an idea of how distance works in uh, multi-dimensional space, some of you have already learned this in uh, math class, say, cal say second year calc or linear algebra. But for those of you who haven't, to give you an intuition as to what Euclidean space is, uh, it's essentially, it's essentially the distance between two points in multidimensional space. In 2D, it's just the line between two points on a triangle. And anything beyond two dimensions, you can, well, in two dimensions and anything beyond, you can calculate it with the formula shown here. <laughs> 
So the example of dimensionality reduction we're going to give here is called principal components analysis. And what you're trying to do here is express, express your high dimensional data as uh, you're trying to express the data as weighted sums of the data's variables. And you try and maximize the variance of each of those weighted sums while also not while also having those weighted sums not correlated with one another. So you're, fi so you're finding independent sorts of variation in the data while also trying to maximize the information you capture for each, uh, for each variable you calculate. So this is the so this is a basic outline of the algorithm without actually doing any linear algebra. So first you standard normalize the data, then you calculate and you make a variable that's a weighted sum of your standard normalized data, and you try and maximize the variance of this. Then you just repeat this step over and over and over, subject to this constraint that each subsequent variable cannot be correlated with any of the previous variables. Sorry, I was just checking if there were any uh, questions. Uh, so now we're going to do PC and the breast cancer data sets, and we're going to look at the 30 input features. So we can load in the required uh, libraries and stuff, and uh, just take a brief look at the data we're going to be looking at. And here are some of the, here are some of the features. So these are. So these are just uh, features calculated based off of images of cell nuclei in, uh, in uh, aspirate biopsies of breast cancer samples. If you don't know what, if you don't know what that is, you basically, you basically just take some cells out, image, image uh, these little round things that contain the DNA and uh, your breast in your breast cancer, cancer samples. And then you calculate some you calculate some features and create the data. Okay, so I'm just gonna run everything for here. And now what we have here is an interactive plot, just giving you an idea of where the distribution of everything is. So it's, a lot of it's not exactly Gaussian. Some of it's like, some of it's, some of it's exponential, but we're just going to be, we're just going to be quick and dirty about things here and, uh, standard normalized things. So as you can ever see, everything is uh, has mean centered at zero. Everything has a uh, variance of one, as can do. So if we calculate the variance, the variance everywhere is uh, one. If we look at the mean, it's zero. So yay, our data is standard normalized. As we can see, the data isn't exactly Gaussian distributed, but at this at this point, we're just going to be a little quick and dirty about things. So let's look at the target names and target labels. And zero me zero means malignant malignance, and one means benign. We're not going to be calculating PCA based using uh, using the labels, but nonetheless, we're going to use the labels later on to see uh, how our PCA separates the uh, 
separates our ground truth labels as our samples by their ground truth labels. So let's actually run the PCA. So we just set up an object here. We uh, run the fit method for the object using the uh, data. And then if we look at the explained variance per principal components, we see that our zeroth principal component here uh, explains approximately 45% of the data. Next one, about 20%. Then it, go, then it goes down, so on and so forth. There's a mathematical proof for why the first, why the first, second, third, fourth will have a decreasing amount of variance explained, but that requires a little bit of lin linear algebra, and we're not going to go into that here. Another thing I should note is that uh, usually when people talk about principal components, they talk about first, second, third, and fourth principal component. They don't talk about the zeroth principal component. It's just that Python uses zero-based indexing, and I guess I was feeling a little bit lazy when I was making this. So we're just referring to things as principal component zero, one, two, three, four, with zero as the, uh, fir as the first one in terms of order. As we can see here, uh, there are different levels of association of the features with each principal component. Some of these guys are really associated with principal component two. Uh, some of these guys have a positive association with principal component zero. Some of them have a negative association. So, the associations I'm showing here are just the weights that were used in principal component analysis. And as you can see, everything's getting a, everything's getting a uh, different weight. And the weight is what's used to uh, calculate each print, calculate each principal component. I express every, uh, express these uh, surrogate variables as linear functions of your input data. And these weights can be considered uh, associations with each, with each principal component. And if you're curious about looking at the actual values, you can just run this code here and take a look at the actual values. And uh, this is just a data. This is just a data frame showing a combination of the features, as well as the first three principal components, zero, one, and two, as well as uh, as well as uh, the malignant or benign label. So don't worry about this code here. It's just a helper function for making PCA plots. So if we actually look at the plot, we see that mean radius has a strong association with principal component zero, mean concavity, similar sort of deal. Let's see what else have we got here. See, so yeah, you can you can visualize associations of uh, different variables with uh, the various principal components. So in this case, it seems that there's some association of mean smoothness with uh, principal component one and total less extent principal component zero. And if we actually look at where the labels pop up. Amazingly enough, uh, the first two principal components, principal component zero and principal component one, 
uh, almost perfectly separates uh, the malignant and benign tumor examples. So now let's go on to clustering. So what you use clustering for is uh, grouping things into similar groups. So as human beings, we're pretty good at pretty good at having an idea of how to do this. If it's uh, in two or three D space, or if uh, judging which images look similar to one another. But uh, if we wanted to decide which things are similar to each other based off of where they pop up in data space, well, we could do this for, say, two or three dimensions based off of eyeballing it. Uh, beyond three dimensions, we're pretty terrible at it because we can't visualize beyond three dimensions. To go with that, you might actually want to have a definition as to how you divide your groups up. So that's where clustering comes in. It gives you an automated, I guess, unbiased, quote unquote, way of doing this. So one of the most common, one of the most commonly used methods for clustering, or one of the most basic ones, and one you certainly learn in an intro to ML course, would be k-means clustering. So what you try to do is, across all samples, uh, minimize this inner sum here, which is just the distance from, which is the distance from uh, the exam, the, the data point to the cluster sem center, multiplied by one for if this is if this sample is. Uh, part of the cluster and zero otherwise. So you're just trying to minimize, you're just trying to minimize uh, data point distances from their cluster, from their group centers, if you will. Here's a link if you uh, want to learn more about the actual process of optimizing this function here or minimizing it in this case. But let's dive, let's dive into the data. So we run clustering, and as we can see here, we, uh, with the code I've written, I've added an additional column to the, uh, to, I guess, the pandas data frame here. That just denotes uh, where It just, it just denotes uh, which cluster things were assigned to. So we have a cluster zero on the right and a cluster one on the left. If we actually look at uh, where the malignant and benign th and uh, benign tumor samples come in, we see that it actually matches up pretty nicely with uh, where the clusters and where the clusters ended up. So here I just did clustering based off of principal component zero and principal component one. And as you can see, the uh, what k-means does or tends to do is it finds nice circular clusters that have uh, the data points near to the center, near to the uh, center of their respective clusters and to the center of any cluster that they're not in. So let's see what happens when, when you try three clusters. So similar sort of deal where you have three groups split across uh, principal component 
component zero, principal component one. And uh, again, the data points are closer to the means of their respective clusters than to the means of uh, clusters they're not in. So here are just some here's just some just some extra notes on uh, what you can do to assess what's the best number of clusters or how stable your clustering solutions are because uh, you can get different you can get uh, different results with different samples of data from the real world. You can get different results depending on different initialization states. I'm not going into that today, but there are links for more notes. Uh, so then we have uh, we have a little side note here on choosing the ideal number of clusters, and this just you just have a score here called the silhouette score which just compares the distance between samples from the same cluster to uh, samples in the nearest in the nearest cluster so ideally you should have uh, a high distance of uh, your samples in a given cluster to samples in the nearest cluster that aren't in that aren't in the uh, cluster in question, relative to distances between all samples in the same cluster between uh, all samples in the same cluster. So, if we actually go and calculate this for uh, each number of clusters, two clusters, three clusters, four clusters, five clusters. And we see that two provides the best results. Three is kind of okay, as is four. And then five, six, seven, it, around five, the uh, score just drops off, meaning you two is probably the best you could use. Four is okay. okay. And then five and after, uh, you probably shouldn't. You probably shouldn't be splitting it there. So just to summarize, we did a little data exploration of uh, the breast cancer data sets uh, from example data sets from Scikit-Learn with PCA, and learned how clustering can automatically group similar samples together. So over the next week, you're going to have the opportunity to apply what you've learned to today in the two workshops, as well as to learn more about machine learning on your own and do some cool stuff with the data sets we've provided with you or with data sets you're able to find on your own. So with that, I'm opening you can ask questions in the chat. Okay, so uh, I guess for questions, uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay, uh, I guess without without any other questions, 
Okay, actually we do have questions now. Uh, yes, you technically you technically can do clustering with uh, discrete vi with discrete variables. All you really need is uh, vectors vectors of numbers, and then uh, you try you try and you try and minimize the distance between uh, sample between samples in the same cluster. Yeah, you try to minimize distance between samples in the same cluster. Uh, so that goes into the uh, obtaining, obtaining data and cleaning it. So, yes, you could do something like you could do something like web scraping, or uh, you could. All, I think with the data set, I think with some of the data sets provided, like the like the Johns Hopkins ones, for for example, they should provide. I think with the Johns Hopkins COVID nineteen, it provides COVID nineteen data set. It provides like pretty regularly organized data. It's not in tabular format, but if you wanted to like generate something like counts in a particular area or something like that, or counts per day or something like that, you would have to write, you, you would have to write your own code or if it exists out there, find somebody else's code and make sure it works to basically transform the data into a form you can input into these uh, machine learning procedures. So that's a bit of a pain in the butt, but it's part of life. Any other questions? We'll give it uh, another two minutes or so uh, for someone to ask a question. And then if there aren't any after that, uh, I guess we'll just close this off. Uh, yeah, so I did provide the, uh, so there is, so uh, let's see, let's see. So, so there's a link to notes from an undergraduate course at U of T. So this is from, I think, okay, yeah, it's from winter, it's from winter 2019. And, and there are tutorial notes. So just a basic review of probability theory here. Linear algebra. There's also a review of uh, linear algebra. Of course, these review slides here aren't uh, These will get these will get you through the basics, and you'll you'll be able to read along read along with stuff. But it's recommended that you actually go through the materials for an undergraduate course in say second year statistics and uh, linear and linear algebra. Uh, and then this course other provide also provides lecture slides for uh, for machine learning. Uh, so here's an example. This goes over decision trees. 
And generally, I think it's comprehensive enough in terms of the definite, in terms of the definitions of things. Uh, but since you're still in, since you're still an undergrad, you might want to, you, you might want to actually be take these, take this course or an equivalent course, uh, depending on where you're going to school and actually go, you'd actually want to go through the assignments, which would help you learn this better. Okay. Uh, Yes, another minute or so for uh, people to ask questions. And if nobody, nobody has any questions, then I'll close this off in a minute. Okay, so if there are no further questions, then I think we'll just uh, close this off then.